This morning, let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew 13, the text that we read at the beginning of the service. Last week, if you were here, we started a new series entitled The Greatest Stories Ever Told, and we have begun to investigate the parables of Jesus Christ our Lord. These, of course, are earthly stories with spiritual lessons that we need to observe and heed. Uh, We, uh, as a subtitle, have adopted this little phrase, short stories pointing us to the greatest story. Of course, the whole Bible is one big story, and it's the rescue story of God and His Son, Jesus Christ, who came to uh, save the human race from destruction and sin. And uh, all these stories in some ways point us back to that story. We learned last week that Jesus spoke in parables, these stories, for a number of different reasons. Three of them were this, one, to fulfill prophecy. It was said that he would open his mouth in parables. We also learned that speaking in parables, he did that because he would use it to unveil truth to seekers. Those who truly wanted to follow Jesus, as he told those stories, they would inquire more and it would unpack for them the treasures of the gospel. But at the same time, those parables, they would unveil truth to seekers, but they would also veil the truth from rejectors. People who kind of stiff-armed Jesus Christ, they would listen to these stories and just kind of get... uh, Get lost in just the story itself and not seek any more. And God did this, as we saw last week, in some ways as mercy to them because he, many of them had been hardened. And lest they be continually hardened even more, he used veiled language in order to protect them and ultimately, possibly in the future, unveil it to them in the days ahead. Today we look at kind of the first of these parables. It may not have been first in order, but the writer of the book of Matthew places this parable at the front of this chapter. In fact, Matthew chapter uh, 13 has seven parables, and Matthew includes this one and strategically places it here, as no doubt Jesus did, in order to kind of be an introduction to all the parables Kind of as a directional sign. Why do I not understand this? Why do I? And who are the ones who truly are going to understand the teachings of our Lord? This particular parable, the parable of the sower, is one that is found in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There is only a few parables that appear in all three of those particular books. It's also one of the only ones that Jesus chooses to explain to us. Many of the parables he would give, and now years later, you and I are interpreting those parables. And of course, his disciples no doubt asked, and he, he unveiled things. But in this particular parable, God unpacks it for us. The parable is entitled, The Parable of the Sower. Or some people call it the parable of the soils, because really the sower shows up at the beginning, but the focus is on the various soils. So for probably a long time, I've just referred to it as the parable of the soils. However, then I realized as I studied this text more intently this week, Jesus calls it the parable of the sower. So I'm going to call it the parable of the sower. And so today we are going to investigate this particular parable. The telling of this parable comes to us with some background. Many of you know as we read the beginning of this chapter last week, and we read it at the beginning of the service this week, it comes after a kind of shift in the teaching of Jesus. Hostility has arisen against Jesus and what he's doing in this world. In fact, he had been uh, performing his earthly ministry now for almost two years, and many people were rejecting what he said. And so Jesus now transitions to speaking in parables. 
And he's doing this particular parable. He's teaching it by the Sea of Galilee. I've been to that particular sea on numbers of occasions. In fact, on my last visit, I got to go into the Sea of Galilee. If you've ever been there, you will know that it is surrounded, this sea, it's more like a big lake. It's surrounded with mountains on all the different ends of it. And so it kind of forms somewhat of an arena, or you could say a coliseum or a, of an amphitheater. And here the Bible says that Jesus got into a boat, sat down as rabbis do it that day, and he began to speak, and the people were on the shore going up the mountain. And no doubt, just imagine even the wind. Of course, we know that Jesus is the God of the heavens and the earth, and he controls the wind. Just imagine the breeze coming off that lake and shooting up the mountain carrying his voice as he begins to tell this parable of the sower. Luke mentions that the crowds were great. They'd come from various towns. Jesus now had transitioned just to tell to the crowds parables. And he tells them a parable that would have been incredibly relatable in the agricultural situation of that day. Most of us, we don't farm. Most of us are not constantly with our hands in the soil. These people whom Jesus was speaking to, this was life. It was from the field to the table and to the mouth. They understood agriculture. And so he begins to tell the story, and it's divided into two. Jesus tells the parable to the crowd but then he explains the parable in detail to his disciples. That's how it kind of falls about. The first few verses are the telling, the last few are the explanation. But today what I want you to do is I want you to understand really the main thrust of this whole thing. What is God calling his disciples? And if you're here today and you're one of his disciples what does he command his disciples to do in this text? Listen to what it says in verse 18. He says, hear then the parable of the sower. Did you catch that? God wants you to hear it. However, I don't think he's meaning simply audibly allow it to be heard and just bounce off your mind. He wants you to listen to it. He wants you to be someone who allows it to have access into the far reaches of your heart. In fact, a few verses earlier when he told the crowds the parable, he ends telling the crowds with this little phrase. Look at what it says in verse 9. He says this, he who has ears, let him hear. So what I'm calling all of you to do is this. I want you to listen to this parable. Understand what it says and heed the truths of it. What we're going to find today is this. God is calling us to be receptive to the word of God. Be receptive. Receive it. Understand it. Now, Jesus didn't simply want them to have ears to hear audibly. He wanted them to heed it, to receive it, to allow it to soak into their life and to change the way they viewed life as a result of what they heard. And I hope you'll be impacted in this this morning. You'll learn to listen. As we unpack the lesson of the parable, we'll see the parable gives four different types of soil. That's what we're going to look at, four soils, okay? It begins with a sower. And the sower goes out to sow seed. Look what it says in verse number three. And he told them many things in parables. And he says, a sower went out to sow. Now, who is the sower? Now, in the next parable, the parable of the, the weeds, as it says, Jesus is the sower. In fact, he tells you he's the sower. In this particular parable, he doesn't identify himself as the sower. However, he is sowing in this instance, but I believe he leaves it free 
Because many people sow the word of God. In fact, I believe I'm sowing the word of God this morning. The idea is this is when people share, share what? The seed. What's the seed? The seed is the word of God, as Luke says. As a reminder to you, the parable of the sower shows up in three gospels. And so as I studied this particular parable, I printed out Matthew's account of the parable. I printed out Mark's and I printed out Luke's and I compared them all week. And of course, each of them maybe include additional material. And what Luke does explicitly is he says this, the seed is God's word. Matthew adds this, the seed is the word of the kingdom. It's the message of the gospel, the message of Jesus and and the kingdom that he's going to set up. So a sower goes and shares the word of God, shares the message of the kingdom. And in fact, this goes on all the time. This is servants sowing the word of God. This is happening right now as I speak. I'm sharing with you words of God. This happened maybe on your way here. You maybe have listened to the radio and you heard someone sharing the word. Maybe it happens in your family as someone opens up the Bible and shares the scriptures in your family at the dinner table. Or maybe it's you sharing the the message of the gospel at your workplace or whatever. This is when the word of God goes out. Either Jesus speaking it or you speaking Jesus' words to other people. It's interesting that the focus of the parable is not necessarily on the skill of the sower. It didn't say that he had a really good throw. It didn't say that he he was very fast. It just says he just sowed. It's not on the skill of the sower or the quality of the seed, but it all depended on the soils that it was planted in. And what Jesus does is he uses four types of soils to illustrate the receptiveness to the word. In fact, even today, as I speak it, all of you are kind of like a soil in how you receive the word of God. In fact, Luke, in his account of this parable, points out that the soils are pictures of the condition of human hearts. You today, your innermost being is your heart, what you what you believe, your mind, your emotions, and the will, the decision-making uh, center of your being. The condition of your heart is in many ways illustrative by these soils. Notice there's four types of soils. We read it a few minutes ago. The pathway, the, the hard ground of the pathway, rocky soil, soil with thorns in it, And then finally, good ground. And each of them illustrate the human heart. So let's look at the human heart. The first one would be this, the hard heart. And of course, Jesus explains this in verse 4 of our text of the parable. It says this, And he sowed, and some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. So as the sower is giving it, out the seed, some of the seeds fell on the pathway. Now in that day, the fields were separated not necessarily by fences, they were separated by pathways, not by gates, but they didn't build as much and and wood wasn't as plenteous. And so it was simply the pathways that separated field from field. It's almost like the machinery paths that we have in our day between one field and another where the two ruts of the machinery go and the soil is very hard. What the parable says is the seeds that were sown on the pathway, two things happened to them. Some, according to Luke, were trodden as they were walked upon by people in the path. But all of them include that some of them, the birds went and plucked them off the pathway and took them away. Now, it's interesting. If you know geography and you know the area of Galilee, the land of Israel and the land of Galilee is right in kind of a very strategic point when it comes to the migration of birds. You look at Europe, in order to connect it with Africa, 
they come this way and from Asia down to Africa. And this little, you could say, wind tunnel is known for all the birds that come through this particular area, even to this day. In fact, one of our trips, we visited the Hula Valley, which is a, a kind of a nature preserve. And there are millions and millions and millions of birds that come through here. It's interesting to know that when you think of Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink. You remember he says, consider the, the birds of the air. I feed them all. And that was descriptive to them. But not only that, what he's saying is this. They were familiar with scattering seed, which was valuable. And seeing it hit the pathway and very quickly what would come, the birds would land there and they'd pluck it up quick and they'd be gone. Jesus explains what that is in verse 19. Go down. It says this. When someone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown among the path. You know what this speaks of? This is people who hear the word of God. They're like sitting in here this morning. They hear the word of God, they listen to this parable, but you know what? They don't understand it. They don't really concentrate in on it. And you, they get done and it's just like in and out, in and out. It's kind of like the, the first time I took a philosophy class in college. And you know we're taking a philosophy class? I remember the first philosophy class I took. I was like, what did he just say? I didn't understand a thing here. Now, I was even trying to. Okay. I was even working at trying to understand some of this stuff. Here, Jesus had people who he was teaching. And you know what? It was almost like they heard the parable. They didn't understand it. What happened in that whole situation? Well, somehow people's hearts had been blinded by the evil one. The Bible says that the birds were like Satan who came and plucked up the seed lest they hear the word of God and get life. Did all of you know that there is a whole nother realm out there that you and I don't see? We live in this dimension. But if God for a moment allowed you to have another lens and see all that's going on in this world, there is a whole nother, you could say, template you can put over this. And that is angelic beings. Satan is real. His hordes are real. And what are they trying to do? They are trying to divert people from hearing the truth of the gospel to, you could say, damn them. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians tells us this. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You know what Satan desires to do? He desires to harden hearts, dull ears so that they don't hear. No doubt he loves to use distractions, okay? So the truth doesn't go unheard. You know, there have been numbers of times, and those of you who have gone and tried to share the gospel with people, I have seen this on numbers of occasions. I remember my first ministry, I'd go oftentimes on Monday night and go visit people who had visited the church, and I'd go in, and I'd, I didn't know if they knew the Lord or anything like that, and so I'd go to their house, and all of a sudden I'd start to share the gospel, and what would happen? The phone would ring. The TV would be really loud. The dog would start to bark. And then you could just tell, and sometimes you can just tell people, they're like, they're not tracking at all. There's sometimes, he won't even let you in the house. I remember one time, it was already, uh, it had already been like the change of times, and I was going to visit, and it was already dark, and I, I was walking to somebody who had visited our church, and I got almost to the door, and then I got walked out by the guard dog. And I was like, if I was ever scared of a dog, this was it, because I took little step, and this guy was growling and pushing me, and I never even got into the house. And even in my mind, I'm thinking, I wonder who was trying to work on that dog to keep me away from that house. Did you know that there are, at times, uh, situations just like this want to keep people from hearing the word? 
And you know what Satan does? He wants to dull people. And they have hard hearts where the, the seed of the gospel never gets implanted into them. Sometimes it's a baby crying or the television screen. Listen to what Paul tells the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4. He says this, In their case, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You know what he doesn't want people to see? He doesn't want people to see that Jesus is the one true God who died on the cross and rose, and he is the central thing in all of earth. He doesn't want people to hear that, so he's going to distract And there are people, you know what, who hear the word of God, it just makes no dent on their life. And we must pray that God would overrule as 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says. Listen to what it says. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Did you know at some point in all of your lives, God overcame that darkness and opened your eyes and said, let the light shine. And your hearts came open to the gospel. That's grace. We'll talk about that in a moment. But that's what we need to pray for. God, and all of us know people who are dull of hearing. They don't hear the gospel. You can give it to them. It's like they're go- it's going over their head. And our job in that situation is God open their ears. I need to keep sharing, okay? But pray. So that's the first type of soil. The second type of soil is rocky ground. And what I call this is the departed heart. You say, what's this? This isn't soil that necessarily has rocks all on the surface. There's some areas in Israel. I remember some, somewhere between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. I remember driving through some areas of the country. And you looked out in the country and there was rocks everywhere on the surface. I mean, it was everywhere. I don't think that's what's being talked about here. What I believe is being talked about here is ground that looks like a great field and fertile, but just underneath the surface is a layer of bedrock or limestone that the seed gets planted in, and they don't know that that rock is underneath it. It's like in your yard, your yard may look really good, but you get a shovel out there and you're about to dig into it, and all of a sudden you realize there's some rock right underneath it. I think there's some areas around here that like uh, Stone Mountain goes right through. I think one time I was at Happy Acres and Tom Young was telling me that this particular thread of rock goes right through this particular area. And what he's saying here in this text is there's some ground that looks really good, but underneath it, there's rock. There's a hardness. In fact, Jesus explains it in verse 5 and 6. He says this, other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. The picture here is of a seed that gets planted in the, you could say, some fertile ground at the top, but it doesn't have any depth to it. And as a result, the plant initially gives a lot of growth on the outside because it can't grow roots. It uses, you could say, all of its energy and nutrients to show some great outgrowth. But when the sun begins to bake and there's no moisture because of the rock underneath it, it very quickly, what? It dies. Jesus explains what happens here. Look what it says in verse 20. He says, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, and this is unusual. It says this, and immediately they receive it with joy. Yet he hath no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. You know what this is? These are people, are those who hear the word, and you know what they do? This is awesome. Oh, I receive it. Yes, I, I, I believe this. But a little bit later, hard times begin to come when it comes to really putting the word into practice. 
and really living out what they're saying they've confessed. And what do they do? They fall away and they're not real. Let me do a little warning here. You know what? This happens a lot with the children who grow up at Lebanon Baptist Church and all around here in all churches. You know, what kid wouldn't have joy to find out that they're no longer headed to hell? I don't have to go to hell and there's joy and there's happiness. And there's a lot of people, you know what? You, you, you share the message of Jesus and man, they, they start to realize, oh, he does this and he does this and he'll give me fire insurance and oh, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'll take them. And there's joy for a little bit. They're excited, but there's no commitment of their life to Jesus. And have they truly turned from their sin and chosen Christ to be their savior. When persecution arises, when they hit the college, or when they get a little bit older, they don't endure. In fact, many people who've gone through the baptismal tank here, they may express joy, but you know what? What is the evidence of genuine faith? It's abiding in Christ. You say, prove that to me, Pastor Brian. Listen to what John 15 or John 8 says. Jesus said unto the Jews who had what? Believed him. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Did you know that true people who follow Christ will abide? Let me give you another one. Listen to what it says in Colossians chapter 1. If indeed you continue in the faith, Stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So what happens to people? They continue in the faith. They persevere. They continue on. Now, that doesn't mean they don't struggle and have hard times. And there are times we have crises of faith. But you know what? There's something that we have done. Where else can I go? He's the one who has the words of life. And you go back to him. So what happens when these people leave? Listen to what 1 John 2 says. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have what? Continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. You know, one of the things we do on a regular basis is we invite, we, we tell people who've confessed Christ and that we bring people into our membership. Hey, these people have confessed Jesus Christ. But you know what we also have to do? There are times that people just don't show up for a long period of time. True people of faith, are they going to continue? They're not going to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. In fact, even in our our own church constitution, in order to kind of model this, what we do is this. If a person doesn't show up at Lebanon Baptist Church for six months, at that point, we have to evaluate of just releasing them and no longer affirming that they know Christ. Because people of faith keep going. They, They keep growing. They keep abiding. I mean, we got people who are members of churches all over the Atlanta area, and they think, oh, just because I joined that church when I was 10 years old, that I'm going to heaven when I die. And they're relying on, hey, an emotional experience. I had a bunch of joy. I can remember the joy I had. You know what? Here's someone who had joy immediately, but when hard times came, you know what the Bible says? Repent and believe the gospel. You're turning to Christ. There's nowhere else you're going. You're going to him. And that life is going to radically change. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I remember when I was a, I believe it was a freshman in college, I went to, uh, on a mission trip to New York City. Uh, it was a, a trip that was organized by the Christian school that I was in that normally had juniors and seniors in high school. And that year I was a freshman in college and I was able to go and help be one of the leaders. And one of the things we would do in the middle of the week is right in the middle of the week, we'd take all the kids to the laundromat. We told them to only bring enough clothes to get them through half the week. 
And the reason for that is we wanted them to wash their clothes in a laundromat midway through the week so they'd have about two hours in a place to talk to people about Jesus. And I remember on one particular occasion that year, I was at the laundromat with my group. And so we all put our clothes in and then we started looking, who can we talk to? And the owner of that particular laundromat was there and I said, hey, uh, do you have a moment? Do you mind if I share with you how you can know for sure how you can have eternity with God? And can I share the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ? And he says, yes. He says, come back to my office. So I was like, okay, I can do that. And so he brought me back to his office and it was another guy named Jay and myself. And uh, he said, he, he laid two seats out and he says, explain. I was like, oh, wow, this is great. And so I went through the whole plan of salvation. So said, this is how you can know for sure you're on your way to heaven. Uh, and then I got to the end and I was like, so would you like to receive Christ as your savior? And he was like, yes, I would. I'd love to. And I would say, let me, let me just make sure you understand this all. And I explained it all over again. And you know what he did? I said, do you want to receive Christ? He says, yes, I do. And that day he, he prayed right there in that back room. And as soon as we were done, okay, no, no joke. He looked at me and says, do you mind watching my laundromat for a few minutes? I said, sure. And he runs out the front door. I'm like, where's this guy going? He runs down the street and goes to a donut shop and buys a bunch of donuts and a bunch of coffees for our entire group. In fact, a lot of our kids didn't even drink coffee. So we had a lot of extra coffee. And he said he was so joyful that he had received Christ. I never saw that guy again after that day. Okay? I don't know if one day I'll meet him in the courts of heaven. I hope I will. How will I know? If indeed he continued in the faith, stable and steadfast. Did what happened, was it real? Did he truly embrace Jesus Christ? You know what's going to happen? People who embrace Christ, there's going to be a point of they continue. They keep following. And if they've gone off the, the tracks and they don't, you know what we keep doing? We keep going after them and telling them. And hopefully that hard ground's going to break open. But here is a soil that immediately is joy. And so... Mom and dad, don't just rely on, hey, they got saved when they were five. And so everything's good. I can just like, I don't have the disciple anymore. They're on their way to heaven. We want to teach them how to grow in their relationship with Christ. Now, is salvation instantaneous? Yes. Now, don't don't take, get me wrong and think I got to earn my way to heaven by abiding. Okay, when you get saved and when you truly accept Christ, he forgives you all of your past sin, present sin, and future sin, and you are always saved. But the evidence of that is you continue in the faith. That's one of the evidences, as, as, as I mentioned. So that's the second type of soil. The third one is this, the soil of thorns. And I call this the choked heart. This was soil that seemed to support the seed at first, but the thorns kind of choked the life out of it. I saw it illustrated in my backyard when I, when I first bought my house. We, we have a number of trees in our backyard. And, and in one section of our backyard, there was a bunch of trees that had ivy on it. And that ivy was just crawling all the way up. And it had gotten, in many ways, all the way up into the, the leaves of the trees and was just taking the life out of those trees. This is more on the minuscule basis. Here's a little plant that's been planted in soil that also has seeds of weeds, and those weeds choke out. That's what Jesus says. Look what it says in verse 7. He says this, Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. This was soil that needed, I mean, uh, Jesus, let's go to the explanation first of all. Verse 22. He says this, as for that which was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word 
and it proves unfaithful. So here are people who hear the word. However, there are certain factors that choke the word out of their life. One of them was this, the cares of this life. What are the cares of this life? You know what? We got, all, we got a bunch of them. Taking care of our body. Taking care of our family. Are those good things? Yeah. Working a job? Yeah. Taking care of our house? There's a lot of things that go on there. You know, there's a lot of people. They take care of all the cares of this life, but you know what they do? The cares of this life choke the word. Because all they do is cover this life. And there are a lot of people, they live this life and they don't want to listen to the word because they, they're focused on all of this world, this life, what's going on here. He adds to that not just the cares of this life, but the deceitfulness of riches. Did you know that money can deceive you? I think in Proverbs it says, it will make itself wings and fly away like an eagle toward heaven. You'll never grasp it. It'll never satisfy. What shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Luke adds to this, the pleasures of this life. All the pleasures. I mean, we got lots of them. I mean, nature. I mean, today, I'm hoping to be able to walk outside today and enjoy some of nature. But you know that even nature can be such that I just give myself to the pleasures of this life, that I don't soak in the world. I mean, the word into my life. I've got to. It's almost like a husband in front of the TV. His wife's trying to talk to him. And how much is he hearing? Nothing. He's so focused on that TV and what's going on. All he hears is Charlie Brown's teacher. Okay? Wah, 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 wah. Wah, 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 wah. You know what? The cares of this life have blinded the word of God in our life. Some of you, if you've made a profession of faith, but the word has choked you in such a way that there is no fruit, there's a problem. If you have lived your whole life for the cares of this life, and it's very rarely that you ever listen to God's word, have you ever really followed Christ and chosen him? The word is not important to these people, and there's a warning here. But then the final soil is the good soil. You say, what's that? That's the fertile heart. That's found in verse 8. It says this, other seeds fell on good ground and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And what does Jesus do when he explains this? Go down to verse 23. He says this, for as, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands. He opened your ears. We all begin with hard hearts. We need the grace of God to give light. But at the same time, did you know he's talking to his disciples? And what is he telling them to do? I want you to hear. And the idea is this. Those of you who are even his disciples, you need to be people that learn how to hear and listen and understand and inquire and want to know more. There is a human side to this, a human responsibility. This isn't, hey, let go and let God. God, you're going to have to... Smack me across the face with your word every time. No, you need to be somebody who's digging in and wanting to know more. If you've received it, you know what you're supposed to do? You now have the Holy Spirit who wants to illuminate more truth. And what you've got to do is you've got to do in some ways what I had to do with those trees in my backyard. You know what is always on the attack? My ivy. I had to chop it off at the bottom of my trees, and over the next year, it kind of cleared up. But I'm having to continue with all the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches to continue to walk with God and want to know His Word each day and guard myself. That's what disciples do. Disciples want to know more, and they're out to inquire and, and, and learn. What does the Bible say about Ezra? It says Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. 
You know what you become? You become someone who wants to know more, inquires, and asks God to continue to give light. And what type of response will a fertile heart do? It will bear fruit. And notice it doesn't say this. And the good soil, some will bear a hundredfold, and some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold, and some will bear no fold. Does it say that? Or is there always going to be a fold? There will be growth with good soil. And it's interesting, Jesus, when he paints the picture here, he's using very strong, I mean, great success. To have a hundredfold harvest, a lot of them, that would be unusual. You find it at least in one instance in Genesis, I think, 26, and one of the patriarchs, you read about one of them who had an incredible hundredfold harvest. And it was to be known. It was to be celebrated. I mean, it's almost like this. Imagine my son Jacob goes to Home Depot and he buys one bag of pumpkin seeds. And he spends one dollar on it. And he goes and takes those pumpkin seeds and he plants them in our yard. And all of those pumpkin seeds... Each produce, let's say, a maximum 15 pumpkins. And then he takes those 15 pumpkins or from each of those seeds and he sells them in his little pumpkin patch. And let's say he takes $1 and he makes $100. You know what a lot of you would say? That is a great harvest. Let me tell you, those of you who have fertile hearts that seek the word of God, you know what he's going to do? If you keep seeking, he will bear fruit. You say, what do fruit look like? They look like the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Your life starts to change. Not only that, you begin to live out the one another's of Scripture. That's what people who really have heard the Word of God and respond. Listen to what Matthew 7 says. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the what? The fire. That's descriptive. Thus you will recognize them by their fruit. So today... Simple truth, we've learned this. Be receptive to the word of God. Be receptive to it. And I know where it all begins. It all begins with you accepting the greatest seed. Did you know that God sowed one great seed on this planet? And it was his son. And the word of God became what? flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and mercy what are you going to do with the son but as many as received him to them he gave the power to become the sons of God even those who believed on his name you know what happens when you believe in his son and you place your faith and turn to him and he becomes the treasure of your life that seed will bear fruit you who began to hear the word of Jesus and believed in him guess what you're going to do you're going to keep following him you're going to keep asking God tell me more tell me more tell me more until you get to the kingdom of God what have you done with the word of God What have you done with Jesus? And those of you who now have Jesus, are you saying, God, I want more? Where will you go? Where we go, Jesus? You're the ones who have the words of life, and you want to grow in that. The parable of the sower. I trust you will receive the word of God. Let's pray.